everything comes back to communication. All right, you want a pay rise, you want to get a new job, everything comes down to how you say the words that leave your mouth. All right, guys, welcome back to the Dream Out Loud podcast. In today's interview, I'm sitting down with the number one sales coach in all of Australia, my man, Mr. Ryan Tuckwood. There is an order of which we can say things to human beings that can massively impact the value they receive in those words. What does SWISH stand for? It's an acronym that stands for selling with integrity and selling honestly. If you were to go back to your 18 year old self and give him 30 seconds of advice, what would it be? Um, it would be. All right, guys, welcome back to the Dream Out Loud podcast. In today's interview, I'm sitting down with the number one sales coach in all of Australia and also the founder of Swish Sales Training Company. With over 13 years experience in the world of sales, communication, and human behavior, he noticed that there was an aspect to sales that most people didn't like, which made him create a new way in the sales industry. Having appeared on Shark Tank and being the first person in the Australian history on the show to have three of the investors invest personally with his business, he has been on an expansive journey since. Speaking to multiple countries around the world, helping professionals become better at sales, at the sales game while remaining with integrity. So please help me welcome the guy who went from sleeping on a bathroom floor with 31 cents to his name to now the founder of Swish Sales, which is partnered with companies like Queensland Health, Queensland Education, American Express, Mercedes-Benz, and so many more. My man, Mr. Ryan Tuckwood. Hello, hello. That was a great intro. I can't wait to meet this guy. <laughs> so that was good. I'm really excited for it because, you know, like we've met a few times. Yeah. And then like, I love you as a person a lot. And then when I was reading your bio, I was like, oh my God, I didn't know about all these other things. I'm like, I didn't know about some of the companies you're working with. Yeah. I uh, Like I didn't know about the Shark Tank stuff. I didn't know about your story of... 31 cents to your name, you know, and all these things. So I'm I'm really excited to sort of get to know you even deeper here at the same time. Yeah. All these guys get to know you as well. So yeah, it, 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 it is interesting in that capacity because I normally get asked, why didn't you tell me that when I first met you? I'm like, well, who does that? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> right. And that and that is literally what the, the opposite of what we're trying to teach. Yeah. So. so tell us firstly for everyone, Swish Sales. What does Swish stand for? Uh, Swish is a uh, two-part, right? So firstly, it's an acronym that stands for Selling with Integrity and Selling Honestly. Mm -hmm. um, so we believe that you don't need to change who you are. You don't need to become inauthentic, um, but you can learn to articulate your message better, right? So it's about telling your truth better. Um, and the other part is that it actually crosses way beyond professional life and it crosses into your personal life as well. So just in general, acting with integrity and honesty in everything that we do and um we often say that within organizations or individuals that we coach over time, we embed what we call swish DNA, DNA as horrible as that sounds, into them. And they just, we, we talk about swisherisms and, and, and just doing things the, the swish way, which is just doing right by people. Right. Where, where did it come from? Um, awesome question. So I'll take you back for context. So we started in 2014. We actually started out as International Sales School Gold Coast. So we were international Gold Coast. So it, it actually didn't make any sense. Um, so we were thinking big, but not that big. We were yeah. like, yeah, okay. So we wanted to be an international sales school on the Gold Coast. Um, so it was ISSGC. It was the same year that ISIS came out. Great. Um, ISIS had a much stronger SEO than we did. So, say, at least you um, Google search. What so, did it, oh, did we, it help we, you Google search? No, you don't want to Google search that. Um, especially because it was, we were recruit, we did sales recruiting. So it was, yeah. if you searched ISS recruitment, it was, uh, <laughs> somebody's knocking on your door. Yeah. So, so we changed that pretty quick. We, we, we evolved to ISR training, which was instant sales results. Then it was um, international sales and real estate training. We started about off in real estate. Um, and then in 2018, post Shark Tank, Jack and I, the the co-founder, he exited 2020. We we're having a discussion about potentially rebranding. I said, I just don't feel that ISR means anything. And he just said to me, is there, is there anything that you consistently say when you do your training? I said, oh, I don't know. I just, I, when, I, when, I, when I open a room or an event, I say, I want to show you guys how to sell with integrity and sell honestly. And he went, say that again. And, and then it just hit. It was like swish. Um, mm. So it was a bit accidental, even though we might have been doing it inadvertently for a few years. And once we did rebrand to Swish, all of a sudden we started to attract the right people. Um, and with love, we started to repel mm. the Jordan Belford, Wolf of Wall Street wannabes. That's what I want to get into, right? Because 
for you to start wanting to teach people selling with integrity and honesty without even so i, I didn't know you didn't i thought you started the company because you're like this is what i want to do <laughs> so where, where did it kind of come from like did you have bad experiences with you know jordan belfort mentality or the let's just call it the old school snakes what do they call it snake oil snake oil snake salesman. oil yeah. salesman right yeah did you have any bad experiences like that or is that sort of how you got indoctrinated into this industry and were mm. you against that or I, I fell into the industry kicking and screaming like i didn't want to be in sales um so my background's actually engineering i was a mechanical maintenance engineer for eight years in the uk i moved here in 2010 i, I often talk about my quarter life crisis at the age of 27 um, I was very comfortable back in the UK. I was earning some good money. I had, an, uh, I had a property, um, but I just wasn't fulfilled. And, and, and that's why I love what you do, right? You, you really kind of help people get out of their own way and reach their potential. I wasn't around any of that, but I just knew that there was more out there potentially for me. So when I moved here, I, I didn't want to get back into engineering. Um, and because I was a backpacker, I was on a working holiday visa nobody would give me a, a job because you can only work on that visa for six months at one company and you have to move on. So it's too, it's just right. pain in the ass for them. Um, so the only work I could get was in call centers. Uh, so I, I wound up in a, wound up in a call center. Um, my job was to smash the phone 300 times a day. Um, and every single outbound cold, dirty, damn right, dirty cold call. I had 90 seconds to find out if a random stranger had 15 to $25,000 liquid cash. Um, what if, were you selling? if you financial services, uh, it was like a boiler room environment. So if, if you said to me, yeah, I've got 18,000, I would then take your details, put it in a tray every hour. The receptionist would come around, take that lead, put it through to the sales guys in another room. We never see those guys. I just knew they were making loads of money. And then they would sell you different financial services advice right. and, and all this like property and all that jazz. Um, I absolutely hated it. <laughs> like I was, uh, I was getting told to go away in no uncertain terms best part of 295 times a day and um for context because it will help explain why i started the business um as a child i was a classic introvert like my mum took me to the doctors because i had weird social anxiety issues like i didn't like public settings i didn't like going to uh school or kids parties or dinners or anything like that so take that kid and put him in the call center and smash him over the head nearly 300 times a day like it, it started to great at me um there were 21 people in that call center i was 21st out of 21 people for the first three months um and then one night and you you referenced it in the intro um i got to the stage where i had 31 cents to my name and i was sleeping on a bathroom floor on a pool floaty um this is here in australia this is in broad beach yeah on the gold coast yeah um and one night it was a i remember it so clearly it was a tuesday night probably about two o'clock in the morning i'm in this windowless box of a bathroom sleeping on this floaty and all of a sudden it pops on me mm -hmm. and I just sink to the floor and I'm like, what am I doing? Right. That's, that was my like, what's the point moment. Um, so the next day I actually went in and I, and I quit handed my notice in and it, and, and this is why, I, why I'm, I'm so passionate about communication and words and how you deliver words and the conviction behind them is because that conversation I had with my sales manager at the time who actually ended up being the co-founder of Swish with me changed the whole trajectory of my life. Because I went into him and I told him I was done. I was like, I'm not made for sales. I'm not an extrovert. I don't have the gift of the gab. I don't have like a resilience to just let things like wash over me. And he looked me in the eyes and just said to me, I'm not letting you quit because you haven't even tried. Mm. And and for me, I didn't really understand it at the time. And I, and I even questioned it. I said, what do you mean? I am. I'm working hard. He says, yeah, you're working hard, but you haven't truly tried to understand the art and craft of sales and communication. Um, and I actually said to him, oh, ironically, I said, that's because it's not a learned skill. And I didn't, I genuinely didn't believe that. I, I, I did believe that. I believed that sales was something you're either born with or you weren't. You either had the gift of the gab or you didn't. Um, and he said, give me 60 days. And since found out it takes the average Westerner 66 days to form new habits and behaviors. He said, just give me 60 days. And if you fanatically obsess over this for the next two months and you don't go from 21st to 20th, just one rung of the ladder, I'll pay for you and Alicia, who ended up becoming my wife. I'll pay for you guys to fly wherever you want in the world, but leave here knowing that you've given this everything you've got. Um, and in my head, I'm like, free flights? Sweet. I'll just <laughs> All I've got to do is get abuse for another 60 days, yeah. and he's going to pay for my flights. Like, I didn't think it would work, and I actually didn't want it to work because if it worked, it meant that he was right, and it meant that mm. I was wrong, and I don't like being wrong. So yeah. I, I would rather have failed and been right. Um, yeah. But 
I became fanatical. I did 15, 20 minutes initially every single day. Um, I, I do talk about Jordan a lot, um, but I also do credit Jordan Belford. Say what you want about him. He, he did everything for the wrong reasons, but it was the first program I did that made me realize that sales is a process. There is an order of which we can say things to human beings that can massively impact the value they receive in those words. Um, and I went from 21st to 1st in five weeks. Um, up to the top. Literally five weeks. It didn't even take me 60 days. Um, and then within 18 months, I did $334,000 in commissions. And my whole life changed. Not, not because of the money, because of the lessons that I had along the way. The, the first one was that sales is impact. Um, my dad... He's still with us today, but um, in 2001, he got diagnosed with really aggressive stage four esophagus cancer. Um, he had uh, the longest non-brain surgery in UK history at the time, 23 hours straight. So wow. they literally ripped his whole face open and he's highly disfigured. He had lots of reconstructive surgery. So through that process, they, they lost their house. They don't have pension. And mm. 2013, I was able to give them money. I was able to send money home and pay their rent and just, just like send them on little holidays. So for me, it was... Sales is impact. And then the other lesson was sales is a process. There is an order of which you can do things that can change. And I just fell in love with it. What's up, Dream Nation? Have you ever wondered how far ahead your life would have already been if you had got access to this type of content at a younger age? Look, this is why I need your help. I'm trying to build the number one personal development platform out there to teach you guys the tips, tricks, and attitude of what it takes to live your dream life and to bring the type of education that we all wish we had in school. This show only grows by word of mouth and new subscribers, so it would mean the world to me if you could smash that subscribe button right now, leave us a five-star written review or drop a comment below and share this episode with a friend. I would be forever grateful. All right, now let's get back into this episode. Take, it, take us through it. the center, right? Because what I know, and I hope everyone listening to this, is sales probably is... I would say probably is the number one skill you could probably learn, right? Sales, because it's it's communication, it's influence. Yes. Yeah. I'm actually thinking about writing a book all on, um, I'm going to actually call it manipulation, because I think it will hook people. Yeah, yeah. Um, because everything in this There's world is... There's an irony in that. <laughs> yeah. <all right>. <laughs> <laughs> I'll manipulate you into reading it, right? Yeah. I'll put that in, right? But like... Because it, it's so true. Like if, if you're not actually influencing someone, you're being influenced by others. And if you're not aware, this is what I love so much about everything we just went through with COVID and everything. Because I'm so aware of influence on every single degree, as much as I, you know, I'm, I'm aware of. I'm, I'm just very conscious of when people are trying to throw shade over my eyes. Mm. I'm very conscious of when people perhaps are doing things out of integrity or when they're trying to manipulate for their own gain or whatever, right? And then I can actually see what's happening and choose my own decision from that. But a lot of people are not aware yeah. of what people might be saying to them or how they're saying. I see so many people get into abusive relationships. Oh, he was a narcissist. She was a narcissist. Yeah, they probably could be. But if you were aware of how other people were influencing you, you'd be able to stop it a lot earlier. So talk to us about, you said there's a process. So what is the process? I'm sure like I know you teach for days on end about it, right? Mm. But if you can give these guys like, something here where they're like, oh my God, I've never thought of it like that. Like what yeah. kind of process is there to communication to really influence someone effectively? Well, and, and I think I'll just pick up on something you said there as well. It works both ways, right? So s call it sales if you want, call it communication. It, do it doesn't matter, but it works both ways, right? You learn the skills of, I, I actually prefer the word in inspiration as opposed to manipulate, persuade, influence, I hate the word convinced because the first three letters don't sit well with me. Um, so I like to call it inspiration. So how mm. can you inspire somebody to do something for the right reasons? Mm. Um, and it just, it always, always, always just comes back to human connection. Everything comes back to human connection. There's the, what we call the 300% rule of value, which is ultimately based across three slash four verticals, which is myself, the company, and the product. Um, what I find often happens is people become obsessed on I need to know my product inside out. I need to know the company inside out. And they forget the human connection. So don't even study sales, study people. Right? Study behavioral science, study emotional intelligence, study personality profiling, like understand empathy um, and understand how to read somebody's nonverbals. If you do that, you'll connect, which instantly gives you then credibility to promote your product or service. Um, and that's what I think is missed because if we look, go back to that 300% rule, you got me, company, product. The most important thing there 
is not me, company, or the product. It's the order of which you sell each one of those. Mm. And you have to come first. Right? So me sharing my story at the beginning, some people would have switched off as soon as you heard English sales train a Gold Coast. <laughs> like, they're gone already. But then I, they share, I share my story, and it has to be your truth. What I was talking about it's just telling your truth better. That helps me now get to the company values and then ultimately the product or service that I offer, which is my sales coaching, if that makes sense. So for, for me, if you really want to influence somebody, you work on the human connection first, the company and the product are secondary and tertiary. All right. So at what point, can we, can we, like, can we role play? Yeah. Can we do this, sell me, sell me a pen? No. No. <laughs> Why? Because it is, it is an absolutely pointless exercise unless you want to go for a full discovery. What do because you, w- you shouldn't be just, I, I will say this to people that are going to get interviewed. If you go for a sales job and the sales, and the sales manager says, sell me this pen, walk out of that interview straight away. Interesting. Uh, does that, I hope you don't do that in your interviews. No, I've never done it in my life. Um, and b- because it means that their thinking is outdated. Their thinking oh. is not about a connection with a human being. Their thinking is about a product. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. So it's uh, like, take, take, everything out of the equation so so it's like selling this pen so what they're actually saying is you haven't even asked them if they want to buy a pen yet is that what you're saying before that before that i I would i would go further than that and i would say based on our interaction so far you've been in this interview now for 12 minutes what personality type do you think i am that's what i'd be wanting them to do do you know Mm. what i mean i I would want to know do you have an ability to read somebody Mm -hmm. in 45 to 60 seconds to know whether the pen is what I'm selling or whether it's the outcome of using the pen that is what I'm going to sell. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So you're, so you're more teaching people how to understand human behavior versus selling a product. 100%. You can sell any product if you understand human behavior. And I, I could, and I've done this, and you know you know Sasha, uh, Sasha yeah, Caraba, yeah, I, yeah. I proved it for him. I, I know nothing about e I, I He wanted me to help him write his script and his sales structure. Um, I said... The best way for me to do that is to listen to some calls. He goes, actually, would you jump on a call? I was like, yeah, absolutely. I said, I'll promise you now, though, I know nothing about e-com. Um, I actually called Shopify Spotify on the call to this guy in America. <laughs> it's a genuine, you can listen to the recording. Um, and I did two calls, one at 11 o'clock at night, one o'clock at one, in the, uh, one at one in the morning, same night, first night. I made two twenty twenty five thousand US dollar sales, and I didn't even talk about the product. All I did was connect with them as a human being and find out what they want to achieve and then attached the vehicle of which we had to yeah. their outcomes. So what, what's your kind of process of understanding? So if I'm understanding it correctly, step one is sort of identifying, being able to understand how they actually communicate so then you can speak their language properly. Would yeah. that be correct? So that, that's if we're talking about, like, that's once you've got them. Step one is prep. Step, we've got a 10-step process called the negotiation ladder. Step one is preparation. Can we for go for it? Yeah. Prep, oh, prep is um, role play. Prep is regulation. Prep is do you have everything logistically set up. Um, prep is your professional stalk on the customer. Um, so, And that's that's obviously relative to the price point as well. So if you're selling a $100 ticket yeah. something, you're not going to be doing research. But if we're selling six-figure clients, we, we have a definitive amount of time that we're going to spend doing a professional stalk. So is it is it five minutes? If it's five minutes, where do you go? Is it LinkedIn? What's your what's your one source of truth? Is it Google? Are you looking for awards? Are you looking for the values on their website? Like mm-hmm. prep. Then we go into our intro. Um, and our intro, we know we've got four and a half to seven seconds over the phone. Um, one what, point to get them to what like you or J- just to make an unconscious connection. Um, so not to like us to so. Rapport. There's, there's a, there's a, yeah, rapport's an overused word because yeah. rapport is different to everybody. Um, I like Tony Robbins' version of rapport, which is total responsiveness between two humans. So you ask me a question, I give you an answer. If I ask you a question, you feel comfortable to give me a response. And most people will never mm-hmm. get to that stage of rapport. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you, if you look at the Harvard definition of creating a connection instantly, it's 1.48 seconds face to face and it's 4.5 to 7 seconds over the phone. Um, and I, I always struggled with that because I was like, how do I get someone to connect or, or like me in that short amount of time? And then I stumbled off across a quote by um, Zig Ziglar, uh, our good old Zig. Mm-hmm. And he said, if people like you, they'll listen to you. But if they trust you, they'll do business with you. And I was like, 
okay, how do I get them to trust me in bloody four and a half seconds? Um, and I summarized, you can't, but you can get them to think that they trust you because we trust people we know. So the key is not to have rapport. The key is not to create uh, a connection. The, the key is to sound familiar in that first 4.5 to 7 seconds. So instead of saying, hi, am I speaking to Morgan? If I ask, if I say, hi, am I speaking to Morgan? I've just lost that call already because I've just admitted know. that I don't know you. Um, whereas if I was say, Morgan, Ryan, Swiss sales coaching, past tense question. How have you been? How have you been? Past tense question. It presupposes that we've yes, known each other before. Spoke to each other. And, and you will get, um, good, you? And they'll sound confused. And I would much rather they be confused and on the phone than have clarity that you're a cold caller or a marketer or whatever it is and then put the phone down. And this works whether it's inbound, whether it's outbound, because even if it's an inbound lead that you're now calling back from an inquiry, you're still calling them out of the blue. Mm. Unless it's an actual scheduled call, you would look to do that right at the beginning. We call it scrambling their internal dialogue. Yeah. I love this because it's it's something what they're not expecting, right? So I know the two two parts of the mind. We've got our logical brain, our creative, creative brain, yeah. right? And if they're in their logic, it's more they're more on defense, right? Or they're more on it's got to make sense. So you saying that would actually push them more into the right side of the brain. Well, we'll, we'll think think about and I, and and this is this is a, a a big thing that happened to me in 2017. I went to see Tony Robbins, and and Tony said, if people like you, uh, sorry, no, I'm, I was Zig Ziglar. He said people like to buy, but they hate to be sold to. Yeah, right, people lo they love to buy things. We get that dopamine hit when we buy things, but we don't like being sold to. And in my head, I'm like, oh shit, I created a sales training company. What I should have created was a how to help people buy company. Mm. And that's what sent me down the rabbit hole of consumer behaviors. So everything then I shift onto look at it through the lens of the consumer, not the lens of the salesperson. And if you do that, and you, and you literally do that, and you go, right, I've got a lead here. Morgan put an inquiry in you last night. Um, I'm going to ring him back right now out the blue. What is he going to think when he sees that phone ringing? Right? He's going to look at the number. He's going to go, that's a number I don't know. Right? So who is it? I then pick it up. I, 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 firstly, before I even look at it, it's like, who is it? I look at the number. Who is it? Then I pick it up and I go, hi, is that Morgan? He's just gone. Who is it? Who is it? You don't know me. Right? That's, that's, that's the conversation that you've just had in your head within yeah. like three seconds. Before I even get to say anything, I'm on the back foot. So you have to nail that first intro. Mm. Um, so we, we go deep into to that. I mean, I've done 330,000 cold calls in my time. Um, and you learn not to get punched in the face if you do that many cold calls. Um, what, what else, what else can you teach us around? It's like what, what I learned on the weekend, right? I was, I was at another event and I was learning about, you know, behavioral psychology and what I, I forget which company, let's just say it's Walmart. Maybe they did it first. I forget. But what they actually realized was. You, you know, you walk into a Kmart or a big W here and you walk in the store and there's someone always there and they always just say, good morning or hello, welcome. Yeah. Nothing else, not sell you, not, nothing. And what, so what they realized was I always thought they're there to check your receipts. And every time I leave, I'm like, these guys do such a fucking shit job. <laughs> they never check their receipts. And if they do, do, they're like, that. yeah. I'm like, this guy's getting paid to be. Yeah. I literally thought that's what their job was. But what they realized was uh, one of the big companies in America did it first. They put somebody in there to only greet the customers they walked in. And they realized they did two things. One was law of reciprocity. So I'd give them a compliment straight away. And the second one was it would change their thinking pattern because they were walking in thinking they're in this logical thing that and it would change their thinking pattern to more like, oh, I wasn't expecting it. Mm. They were put off. They tracked these people and what they realized was the people would start spending approximately 22% longer in the store, right? And then they tracked it. I forget. I'd be making up the data yeah. for the next one if I if I if I said it right. But it was something a little lower, something like 12, 15, 15 percent more purchases from the people. Yeah, I believe it. So they put this one person in and saw that huge difference. That's why it's been rippled through nearly every single you see it in Big W and all these big yeah. big companies. They have people there to solely just welcome you because it just it so it puts you in a state of being like, oh, I want to give. Back. So take that all the way back to literally what is happening. It's a human connection. Mm. It, you've yeah. gone MCP, right? You're, the first thing they connect you to is the me, the human. They're they're literally putting you in a different frame before you before you walk in. It humanizes the experience. You know, I'm not in a a Walmart or a Kmart or whatever it is. There's a human being that actually lives mm. here. It does. It just changes your thinking straight away. If if you were working in, let's say, let's say you're working in retail, and people coming into your store. It's your job to engage them in the conversation, 
which nearly every single person does. Hey, can I help you with anything today? Hey, how you going? It's always that, that annoying question. Where you're yeah. like, no, 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 I'm good. I'm good. I'm just looking. And then three seconds later, you're like, fuck, I actually need help with a shirt. Yeah. And you don't want to ask them. So if you're working in real in retail and you're that person, what would be your approach to people coming to the store? Yeah, awesome question. Um, and firstly, I did do a little stint at Pack Fair as well. So nice. uh, uh, I didn't realize that I was in sales at the time. I call myself a personal stylist, yep. but I was in retail sales. Um, so for me, I utilize what I call value builders. Um, and uh, I'll give you I'll give you an actual example of something that I, I use in some of with some of our retail clients. Mm-hmm. So we coach a company called Brisbane Isuzu, um, Isuzu Trucks. So they have a male dominated audience and when people walk into the dealership, if a female assistant approaches them, rightly or wrongly, it, it is commonplace, and, it, and I've had this feedback for the last two or three years since we've been coaching them, that the men will go, oh, is there anybody else that can look after me? To the women. Wow. Right? It, it literally happens to, in 2023. Um, and one of the ladies, as, as well, I was doing the coaching session, I said, well, how long have you been with Isuzu for? She says, I've been here 11 years. Ryan, I know more than most of the blokes here about the trucks. I'm like, But it's not their job to know that. It's your job to articulate that. So what I would do, and I would do this if I was in a retail environment and I got her to do it as well and she increases her conversion by 19% in the following three months, was as you walk up, you open with a value builder. What I mean by that is I would say, hey, just so you know, I've been here for 11 years. I've helped over 2,300 people get into trucks. Don't know if I can help you, but if you need any help, I'll be over there and I'll walk off. Right. So it's an open and an exit at the same time. They have no time to tell me that they're not, they're just looking. I don't say, good morning, how are you? All I'm doing is telling you that I'm an experienced individual and if you need anything, I'll be over there. I'm still reapproaching in two minutes, but I'm, I'm giving them that freedom to do whatever they want for two minutes as well. So it just breaks that cycle because we've all walked into a retail environment before and somebody says, good morning, and you go, just looking. Yeah. They didn't even hear the question. We are conditioned to repel it. It's like, and this is where I talk about like, just understand consumer behaviors. That's just looking as a lie. Um, can I have a discount? Are people that disc, I mean, we could talk about this five hours if you want. I got a discount uh, on the way here, <clears throat> but, but I never ask for a discount. I say, oh, it's even worse. I, but I no, I, I, I build rapport with them. I, I'm just, I think I just do it so naturally. I just connect yeah. with people. And then uh, I usually ask a question which gets them thinking about something else. And then immediately, then a couple of seconds after them thinking, I say, what's the best price you could do on this now? And you and should. Then, and he, he got me uh, 40 bucks off, which for the sale was uh, it was about $150 sale, so it came down to $100. Were you going to buy it anyway? Yeah, I was More at the checkout him. and he was putting it in. <laughs> Stupid. And, and this is my point about discounting, right, is we as a consumer should ask for a discount. Yeah. Always. I, I will ask for a discount because most salespeople are crap. So you should, if you don't ask, you don't get, right? Most yeah. salespeople there, and I, I do a session on um, like the top communication mistakes. The biggest mistake is our intent. Our intent is to make a sale and our intent shouldn't be to make a sale. Our intent should be to find out if a sale should be made. Totally different mindset. Um, and because most people's intent is to make a sale, that the second that we get asked a common question, which is a consumer behavior, not a prerequisite to a sale, and we say, can I have a discount? Or can you sharpen that up a bit? Most people will go, Oh, I'll talk to the manager or I could take 10% off. We were going to consume it anyway. Mm. So my reflex to, can you do that any better is I think we both know the answer to that. Have you got any other questions? It's not real. It's just Fugazi. So <laughs> when you don't buy into the, the game of consumer behavior, I should ask, and you just, just move it out of the way and don't get caught up in it, then you, your margins increase and you don't, really know that until you own a business Mm. if it's your own business i promise you you stop chopping up deals like you don't you don't eat into your own margin because you know what you spend on advertising and marketing and and what it costs to get a lead through the door but with respect if you're in retail on the front line 17 18 years old maybe we're a bit well no now screw that age thing because people are still doing it all ages Mm. i uh i remember one time i was signing up well actually i wasn't even signing up for a gym membership i was going to just look at it check it out and this whole asking questions thing, because I used to, this is when I first got into sort of sales and I had my first business and I was like, I want to ask for more than what I want. And I thought I was being cheeky. And then when I left there signing up for the membership, I realized that she fucked me. <laughs> and uh, we're sitting down, we're looking through it all, looking through it all. And and um, and I said to her, I was like, well, I'm, you know, I'm not going to do it today anyway. And she's like, yeah, I know that. I just want to show you options and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. 
I felt I felt like oh she's she, you know she's not yeah. just trying to sell me <laughs> and then um she asked me the question and she's like I know you don't want to I know you don't want to sign up today but what do I have to give you today in order for you to sign up and I was like and so fast I thought I had the upper hand I was like well I want you to give me an extra PT session and she goes done let's do it and I'm like done then I'm like you motherfucker yeah. it's like wow you got me so like the power of questions so I want to talk about this because that she taught me that the power of questions because the brain has to answer questions mm. unless you're really in tune with influence and why they're asking questions. Which, yeah. but like even me, I'm very good at this. But if people ask me questions nine times out of ten, I answer it, and then I'm like, "Fuck, I bought into that." Yeah, yeah. So, what are some powerful questions you've like? I know there's things in sales with like tie downs and all these types of things. So, can you give us some examples of some powerful like linguistic tools you use through sales to get people? more along the journey perhaps yeah um two parts to it so firstly that question that she asked you is very powerful with one personality type it's extremely poor with the other 75 percent of personality types uh, i, I want to hear and, about them and, we'll the, come and this that. is what's important right and this is what frustrates me about sales training not sales coaching out there in the market training is just telling information once coaching is refining and, and helping somebody grow so like how to actually use it um and most of the training out there is one size fits all that nobody's teaching how to adapt to just and respond to the person that you've got in front of you, like actually to, to, to change. And the reason I share that is that you need a banquet of questions, but you need to know which ones to use on which person, right? Mm. Cause there is no, you can, I mean, I, I'm disc accredited. So I like disc personality profiling because it's the easiest one to teach on mass and you can literally teach people to read others in 45 to 60 seconds that's that's the personality types you're talking about when you yes yeah, yeah. disc so um there's myers briggs and wealth dynamics like there's loads of other ones but disc is the easiest one in in a short amount of time like you yeah. can literally read somebody in 45 seconds probably even shorter than that which means if you if you believe that and you work in in those four personality types you arguably need four ways to say everything mm. um which is easily done once you once you know those those different types um, so for me, the, the, there's two parts that are important. Yes, the questions, but the order of the questions. So I'll, I'll give you the order first. So I often say that we have to reflect before we project. And if you want to help somebody find out problems and challenges they didn't even know they had, then you need to get them to look backwards before they look forwards, right? Because what people want is not what they need often. Most people will say to us, we need some objection handling training. That's not what they need. What they need is some discovery question training or some intro training or some framing training or some mindset training and you'd get all that right and you don't get the objections like what they want is often a plaster what they need is a, a proper diagnosis and some training for the root cause so we get them to look back and the way we do that is through what we call reflective questions so let's say we're at the start of an interaction maybe you've inquired pops your details in um and you say yeah ryan i just want some sales coaching I'm like, okay, perfect. So what does that look like for you? Oh, I just, I don't know. I just need help with X, Y, Z. What you've done automatically is look forwards, which means we are now focusing on product. And that is a consumer behavior is that I'll always look forwards because I don't want to go back to the pain. I go, okay, brilliant. We can get into those weeds in a second. Before we do that, take me back. Take me back. How long have you been following Swish for now? Has it been a few years or have you only heard of us recently? That's one of my reflective questions. You just learned that we've been going for a few years through my question. Does that make sense? Yeah. So my aim is to remove limiting beliefs through my questions. I remove objections through my questions, not my answers. So uh, so a reflective question is, have you been following us for a few years now or only, only heard of us recently? Okay, brilliant. Well, um, another reflective question might be, we were pretty fortunate to go on the TV show Shark Tank in 2018. And when the investors come on board, they came with loads of different uh, different. Um, tips and advice but what about you is it just you that's running the business or have you got a few different shareholders involved what you learn is shock right i'm building credibility through my questions but i'm still back i'm still like reflecting so i go reflective questions then i go reality check questions okay so this is where you've been this is what you've done how is that playing out for you right now so based around the decisions that you made previously how's that working out for you right now what does if you could score out of 10, where would you score yourself from a X, Y, Z perspective? You can't say seven. And then I say, you can't say seven. Can't say they seven. always say seven. Yeah. They can't say seven. Now they have to go six or eight. No one, I don't think, and I'll be challenged on this. I'm sure to this day, no one's ever said 10. Um, 
And if they say six or eight, it doesn't matter what they say. Once they finish their, that, they say six out of 10, you go, what would get it to a 10? So it could be IT software. It could be the solar installation they've got. It could be the mindset coach that they've got. Okay, how is that coach working out for you? On a scale of one to 10, don't say seven. Um, oh, six, six, I would get it to a 10. Oh, well, I need them to do this. I need this as well. And they just give you all of their drivers. Uh-huh. And you go, okay, you, then you bank that. So, so the question was, can you repeat the question? So you How happy about, on a scale of one to 10 are you? Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, Out of the, the services or whatever they've been having. Whatever it is. Yeah. Whatever yeah, yeah. product or service. So, you're okay. Discussing. So then you're asking them because they want to get to a 10. Yeah. So if they were a 10, they wouldn't be on the call. Yeah. U- ultimately. And if, yeah. if, they're, yeah. if they are a 10, I would literally say, and I've never had it, but for me it would be, so why are we on the call? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and even if it was a cold outbound call and you've reached them, like you say, well, why are you still on the call then? Oh, you're quite charismatic. I appreciate it. So be honest with me then. Now you know you can be cheeky. Mm. Be honest with me then. Are you really at a 10? Is there anything you'd change about your current provider or whatever it is? Oh, I don't know. Right. So we've gone reflective, looking back, reality check where they are right now. And then we go opportunity questions, which is looking forward. So moving forward then, if you could change a couple of those things, how does that look for you? Ideally. Um, and then they'll hopefully give you the outline. So they've gone past, present, future. We've. I hate this part about sales. I will say this. I never wanted to be one of those salespeople that pushes people people's pain. Yeah. I, I, I don't like it. I still don't like it. I, w- I would much rather paint rainbows and butterflies and, 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 and just paint an amazing future. That's not what moves people to action. That is not what inspires people to take action. Unfortunately, we are a, a lot more inclined, over 90% more inclined to move away from pain than we are to move towards a potential pleasure. Yeah. I'd rather stay in the discomfort that I'm in and be the victim because I know it. If you didn't you pop know. your air mattress, I, you wouldn't have done it. it that, have. that was the best thing that ever happened to me, yeah. like genuinely. Yeah. Um, but having said that, I then chose to quit, not dig my heels in. It was only that I had the right people around me that wouldn't let me quit in yeah. the moment. So, and that's also important. So we have to go through this sequence of questions of past, present, future to find pains and problems that they don't even know they have just yet. Um, and when we figured all of that out, we then can go into the future and go, well, okay, ideally then, let's say we've fixed all of that. Where are we now in the next 6, 12, 18 months? So now we get them on a high and then we go to what we call cost of inaction questions. So what if you don't do anything? What are the ramifications of staying as you are? If we... Which is a great question because a lot of people get um, delusional and they're like, oh, I want to have this. Like I've, you know, people go to an event or a seminar or watch a YouTube video and they're like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. But they never actually question that because I was on a training last night and I was telling people, I'm like, I'm telling them right now, I'm like, I want you to write down all the things that, that hurt you right now. Like you need, to, you need to create some pain. Why? Because when I go off this call... You'll be hyped and excited, but when you got to make that next call or when that next person leaves your business, you're going to remember all the reasons why you can't quit. Mm. Because if you're only thinking about the reasons why you're doing it, I confused my why and my vision for so long. Sure. I thought yeah, my yeah. why was because I want to live in Mexico. It's like my why, I just want to travel the world and have freedom. And what I realized was that's the pleasure. That was my vision. And it wasn't until I got clear, I was like, well, my vision is to live in Mexico, but why I need to do it is because I'm sick of stick- sitting I'm not in gonna traffic stay here. every day. Yeah. And uh, like I, I put a, I shot an, I used to be a carpenter. I shot a nail through my thumb one day accidentally. A grinder went through my arm one day accidentally. Like, so I would hurt myself at work sometimes. Mm. I was like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to live yeah. a life where I could like nearly kill myself at work. Like, yeah. you know, these were the pains and it wasn't easy to look at because it's easy to avoid it. So I love these questions where you can show people exactly, here's what you could create if you decide to stop fucking around pretty much. But what if you don't? Uh, and and that, that, that's a really powerful question is right. And, and I, I will ask that question every single call. Um, where, uh, so the way I'll frame that is, so Morgan, like you said, you've been doing this for, you've been struggling with this for the last 12 months. Okay, so you, you probably knew how you felt three months ago, three months before that, six months before that. So would it be fair to say you'll know how you're going to be fail- feeling in three months, six months and 12 months time if you continue as you are? Yeah. Where could you be if you did something? So it's where will you be versus where could you be? Mm. Right, totally different, uh, totally different question. What's the difference in those two um, ones? Is is one's definitive mm-hmm. and one's potential, right? So now because that's in, but you have to do it after you've gone through the pain. You can't do that at the beginning. 
Yeah. They, they need to go through the pain first to appreciate the future because there needs to be that, that gap, that disconnect of literally here I am right now to there. Otherwise, I'm just, if, if I, when I meet you, when I speak to you for the first time, I could be here. But the reality is they're here, but we haven't taken them back there first. So their gap is like there to there. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I need to take them on that journey to actually bring them to the realization that you're actually here compared to where you think you are. You're just comfortable, so that makes you feel like you're there. So I need to help them find the why behind the why or the the, the why behind the why is the reason not to. And as you said, the mission or, or impact, there's an impact beyond impact. And and that that's, that's for everybody. The impact is not to some people, but not, not very often is it money. Even from a, from a sales coaching perspective for us, when we go, one question I will always ask is like, what are three non-negotiables at the end of this partnership? Let's say we get 12 months down the line, we've trained your team of 100. What will you have definitively needed to have seen for you to know that this was a worthwhile investment? All right, how would you, you're sitting in a boardroom and you go, Swish was good, hey, let's go again. And, and I get them to write it down and we hold them accountable to it. I would say on a corporate level, it's different on a, with, with, with SMEs, but on a corporate level, less than 20% would say sales. Mm. It's confidence. It's uh, team culture. It's cohesiveness. It's less sick days. It's people wanting to join the company. It, do you know what I mean? So yeah. we could assume that they just want to make more sales because we're a sales coaching company. But when you ask the right questions, you actually get a why and an impact beyond. Um, so, so taking it away is important. So just to refresh those four stages, We've gone reflective questions looking back, reality check questions looking in the present, opportunity questions looking in the future. Then we do cost of inaction. What if you don't do anything? And then the final one before I then lead into whatever I'm going to present to them and ask for the business is partnership questions. So, and a partnership question is, so taking all of that into consideration, how are you choosing a provider of XYZ? Not what do I have to do to get your business today? Not what would make you want to use us? I'm still sitting on the same side of the table as you. I'm saying, look, there's loads of providers over there of solar. How are you choosing which one? Oh, well, I need to know it's Australian made. I need to know they've got support here. I need to know they've got all of this. Well, that puts my mind at ease. And that's all I say at the end. Yeah. And then I lead into trial closing and all of that jazz. Yeah, talk to us about closing. What is your... Um I'll share my favorite closing question, but I want to hear yours first. So when, so let's say you've taken through the whole thing. They're like, this sounds great. And you're like, cool. Well, here's our offers and blah, 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 blah. And then there's always like, you have a question and then you meant to shut up, hmm. right? What's your question? What's your sort of process around that right yeah. at the end? Because this is where a lot of people choke, right? They can go through, ask questions, and then it really gets to the, because like I've trained heaps of people with sales as well, like for my old business, right? And uh, this is where so many people would struggle. Like, I just, it's hard yeah. to ask for money or ask for sale or how do you do it? Yeah. Uh, it's interesting because I asked Grant Cardone this on my podcast. Right. I was like, what was his tape to, uh, top three? I think his top one, just for the record, was have you seen enough to, to make a decision? That's, that was his number one. Um, yeah. And he actually started selling me a clipboard in the uh, in the session. So he's very American, very, yeah. very direct. Yeah. Yeah. Which um, I think they, they like that more of there. Americans more do. They expect it. Yeah. I don't want to say they'd like to get sold, but in a way compared to Australians, yeah. Australians almost like, I do fucking need this, but you just sold to me. Yeah. And I, and, and, and I will cut my nose off to spite my face and now not buy it. Yeah. Whereas yeah. Americans will just, Americans kind of like, I like that, you yeah, know, I'll take it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, and, and, and I, I know some really good sales coaches in the U S and I've seen their contact come over here and it doesn't work. Yeah. Um, and even Andrew Banks, one of our investors, he's very good friends with Grant Cardone. Mm -hmm. he, has told us when we went over to the to the to US, we've got a few clients over there. He's like, you need to get your message more aggressive, right? Yeah. Swish is not aggressive enough for the American audience. And we've got lots of clients over there now, but it does need to be a bit more direct. They want guarantees. They want to know ROI. Like they like fluffy stuff, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, trial closing. Um, so firstly, trial closing starts from the open. We're, yeah. all, we're always trial closing. For me, it's lots of micro closes all the way along and that can be as simple as um the tie downs i think you said tie downs mm -hmm. earlier so does that make sense are you following me all of those the obvious ones um but for me i'll get to a stage where i'll present an offer whatever it is um ideally we'll present three so we know that as uh, go back to consumer behaviors we are conditioned to get three quotes on anything that's just the way we make decisions right so okay. i would never ever present one option because if i present one i create um uh, an environment where you now need to go 
and of validate. Course, yeah. So I push you to my market, to the, my competition. So I want you to choose one of my three. So I'm going to give you three options. Um, and, and there's a great um, study in America with three bottles of wine that they did this, where one was $35, one was 45 and one was 125 They put them in a restaurant over a weekend. 85% of people chose the $45 bottle of wine. The um, middle one. Yeah, the middle one. They... The following weekend, they took the $35 bottle of wine. They put a $125 tag on it. They put the $125 bottle of wine with a $35 tag on it. Same restaurant, same wines. 87% of people chose the middle one. They surmised that we don't buy on value. We don't buy on price. We have something called middle offering syndrome. So mm. a consumer, it works with three or five options. So anything outside of that gets a bit messy. Um, so we will always put together three options. Um, and the first two prices are usually within 20, 30%. And then the other one's a bit, um, higher cause it creates comparison theory. Yeah. Um, and it's so big where if anyone does buy, it's a really good day. Just take it's it. Yeah, so yeah. big. So it's like, it makes the other ones not as, and, and some people will say to me, well, and we did this with Mercedes, right? Um, you got a GLC 200, 300 and an AMG and they're like, well, they haven't got the budget for the AMG. I'm like, show them anyway, show them where they could be in the future because I might not want it to spend 250. But I actually didn't want to spend 140, but it's better than 250. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, like, it makes and, a lot of sense. Um, so I'm, I'm big on, as I'm leading into my trial close, I've got my three options. And my trial close is, which one are you leaning towards? Yeah. Not which one's best. Not which one do you want. Which one are you leaning towards? And then whichever one, I don't care which one they choose, because I'm only going to present three options that they definitely need. They're going to help them. Um, it's not about just throwing stuff in there that they, they can't even use. Um, and then whichever one they choose, say they chose A, I just ask them why. Mm. And I get them to just sell themselves. Yeah. Why did you choose that? Why so, not Why not B? Like, I don't tell them which one they should use. And then I'll go into um, an IBO, what I call the IBO, which is, so. so what you're saying is you're leaning towards A. Would you agree then the idea of, something makes sense whatever it is whatever you're offering does the idea you gotta buy an idea before they buy a product does the idea of sales coaching make sense to you in some capacity okay and knowing your situation better than i do and you've been in your industry longer you know your family you know your business you know your staff like do you think they would benefit from whatever you've just put in front of them yeah okay do you mind if i offer an opinion so let's go ibo idea benefit opinion do you mind if i offer an opinion do you mind if i float an idea past you can I make a very subtle recommendation? So I get permission-based closing as opposed to interruption-based closing. Mm. And then if you've done everything right, right, you've got all your value builders in there, you've got all you connected, you've, you've got what I call rapport threading where I'm using reciprocity questions, talking about me to get information from you. They, they know everything about me, the company, the product. And by the time I get to the end, like nobody ever says, no, you can't offer an opinion. Yeah. So now I can say, well, Based around what you've just said to me, based around everything you've shared with me the last 45 minutes, you should probably lean yourself towards this one. And then that's where we have what we call an invisible integrity line that we have to present the right option for them. Yeah. Um, and this is why, like I said, Jordan Belfort, he, he can close deals. He just used it for the wrong reasons. And that's why when you master communication and sales, sales it is influence. It can be manipulation. It can be convincing someone to do things they don't want to do, which is why it's so dangerous. So mm -hmm. anything, any coaching that we do, we're just constantly hammering home that invisible integrity line because selling is easy. And I'll say that really intently now. Selling is, is so easy when you know what to do. Creating customers for life is what's hard because I could promise the world, make a sale, but if I don't deliver on the back end, you ain't coming back. Mm. Um, and that's why so many companies go around in circles. I love it, man. Um, two of my two of my favorite things to do, and, and you sort of nailed at the end there. You're like, they close themselves. That's always been my goal. I'm like, I just want to make this make sense for you because we're obviously on a, on a call, we're, we're having a conversation because there's some type of issue. If I can put something in front of you, it's going to potentially solve the issue. You can decide on that today, right? Or, or like whatever, right? So I've always just got that in my mind. I'm like, I'm, I'm here to help solve a problem. And if I can legitimately solve a problem, I'm going to show you the solution. Yeah. And if I can't, I'm going to send you to probably one of my million connections I have that probably could solve my... Like if somebody comes to me like, can you train me in sales? I could probably teach you a thing or two, but I, I'd rather just send you to Ryan. Yeah. He's the guy that does that, right? I'm like, so I'm, I would not get to the end and be like, 
yep, close you on them. Because like you said, like then I'd have to fulfill on that. Like where the fuck do I even start? Yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah. But my one of my favorite things, I ask them this. I say, out of, out of one to 10, how committed and serious are you to creating that reality? So the, the vision they, they make. And this is what's always interesting because people think you always want to get a 10, which I kind of do, but I don't want them to tell me 10 from the start. Mm. So a lot of times people will say, well, I'm an eight, seven, six. Even the worst thing, right? Like say if you were to think like someone who's like, I really want it, but I'm just not that motivated. I'm a two. So the worst thing you get, I'm a two. Cool. My question, my question back is always that, awesome. Why not lower? Hmm. And I sit and let them yeah. convince me why it actually should be higher. And then if they're like, if it's a two, I've never had a two. It's always a fives for the lowest. Why not lower? Well, because, you know, I have been struggling this for years and these results, I haven't been getting them and this and this is. So are you sure you're a five then? Hmm. No, I'm actually probably closer to like a nine. Why not lower than a nine then? And then after the conversations, they get to a 10. But part of that is mainly sort of getting them actually committed to change. Um, but the best thing about that, nearly every single time I get filled with that, they're like, actually, like, you've got me more committed to actually creating the change yeah. now. So it's not just the sale. And then a lot of time, I'm like, I'm glad you said a 10 because I don't work with anyone who's less than a 10 anyway. Yeah. Which I also believe, like, especially with my higher stuff. Like, I don't want you to come into my mastermind if you're a nine out of 10. Go away. Mm. But then my final question I'll ask is, um, so what should we do from here? Yeah. I love that one because I was like, I don't know. We got everything on the table now. What do you want to do? Yeah. And then I don't say anything. And they're like, well, can I buy it? Yeah. If that's what you want to do, sure. Then let's do that. <laughs> and, and and this is the key, right? If you've, I'm not going to say you won't, you won't get objections. Like there's always going to be objections and friction uh -huh. points, but you can minimize it for sure. Mm. You can soften it. Um, and the question that you're asking there is a cost of inaction question. Um, and I, I do one not based around the numbers, but I, I'll ask them, um, it's, I'll say, it sounds like you're going, all right, why even bother doing any of this then? Why don't you just leave it? Why don't you just, why don't you just carry on as you are? Um, yeah. And it goes against everything that I was ever taught. But yeah. that is where they sell themselves. Yeah. The cost of inaction stage of questioning is where you create urgency. So if I, I say discovery is where, you, so for context, we've got a 10-step negotiation ladder. We've spoke about prep. We've spoke about intro. We touched on framing. We're in discovery, which is stage four. That is where your sale is won or lost in your questions. The best salespeople don't have the best answers. They have the best questions. Mm -hmm. So your discovery is, one or, uh, is where sales are won or lost. The cost of inaction within discovery is where urgency is created. Mm. Um, and if you get all of that right, you literally can go, what do you want? Yeah. What do you, what's up to you? What, you just sit, And that's where you can sit in silence, the old adage. But most people get to the end, they sit in silence. Everything else was crap beforehand. And then the person just goes, well, leave it with me then and I'll get back to you. Yeah. And then they don't know what to do either then at that stage. Yeah. Um, why do you think most people do suck at sales? Um, or, I've, or when I say suck, <clears throat> have a fear around sales. Uh, I'll do the sucking first. Yeah. <laughs> Cut that one up. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave uh, it in. Yeah, um, cause the sales managers are crap. So it's the training. It's tra well, it's not even training. It's, it's, it's the it's the mindset. It's it's the pressure from above to just focus on outcome and just focus on sales and revenue. And if you're focused, like we're as humans, we're seventy percent water and ninety percent of our brain is water. We're we're just a water being, and water follows the path of least resistance, right? So we're going to try and get to the end goal as quickly as possible. If the end goal is to make a sale, you neglect all of the connection. So we're just focusing on product and sales. And I think that comes from pressure from management. And then, so the pressure's there right from day one. And then there is not a proper onboarding. There's not proper training. There's no training that adapts to the salesperson's personality type. I coached a solar company years ago. Um, there was about 15, 15 guys. It was here on the Gold Coast. So I won't name who they were. And I went into their office and the sales manager pulled me aside beforehand. He goes, um, I've strategically sat everybody. Um, and just so you know, the guys on the far left, the three, don't spend too much time on them because we're letting them go next week anyway. <laughs> I'm like, okay, why are you letting them go? Because, oh, they has been the worst performers for the last three months, right? We have a promotion relegation system. If you're bottom for three months, you've got to get let go. I'm like, all right, cool. And he goes, and I'm going to do a little segment just before you come out. I watched this guy come out and he delivered a little training segment. He was a high D dominant personality type, results focused, money orientated, all about the outcome. These guys, you could just see them just glazed over, right? It was not hitting them at all. <clears throat> at the end of the session, I uh, I pulled the manager aside and I said, 
can I just spend an extra 15 minutes with those three? He's like, I told you, I'm letting them go. Don't, just don't waste your time. I was like, that's all right. You don't, don't pay me for it. I'll just stay behind that 15 minutes with them. They were, if, if people know personality types, they were S personality types. They were steady. They were very people orientated. Can, can you break this? Can we quickly go into the disc? disc? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll do it. I'll, yeah, okay. Um, so there's dominant, influencer, steady, and conscientious. Yeah. So your dominant people are, are very fast-paced, very direct, can be quite abrupt. They can be, come across quite abrasive, very results and outcome orientated, right? Not, re not really fussed about the process. As long as we get the outcome that we, we need, we're happy. Um, influencer personality types are also fast and direct, but they're more people orientated. So they're very social, they're talkative, they're outgoing. Maybe they don't have the best attention to detail, right? So from a sales perspective, they sound great, but their administration is a nightmare on the back end. They just want to tell everybody about the sales they've made. Yeah. Um, the steady personality types are slower um, and more methodical, but they're people orientated as well. So on the same side as the the eyes. Um, they're a little bit resistant to change. And if there is change, they need to know they're doing it for the people, not for the money. That was the... Uh, that's the S. S. Um, and then the C, which is ironically what I am, um, conscientious. I'm masquerading these days as an I personality type, but I'm actually a C. So very slow paced, quite reserved, introvert, but task orientated. So I like to get the job done. I'm very process driven. Everything yep. has to make sense for engineer me. Engineer background. Engineer. So perfect yep. for an engineer, yep. terrible for a public speaker. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but everything can be learned. <laughs> but everything can be learned, right? Yep. Um, so these guys were which type? So the, the manager was a D. Yep. Fast paced direct. And the th all three sales guys were an S personality type. Right. So there was just a disconnect. There. So the manager wasn't training them in a way that made sense to them. They weren't hearing the message. And he's like, I don't get it. All the other guys seem to get it. I'm like, because you're not adapting your style as a coach, which we have to do as a, yeah. as a leader. Um, so I had 15 minutes with them. I basically translated his message from the start of the session. I delivered my session anyway, which speaks to all personality mm -hmm. types in the room. Um, they were the top three performers that following month. Wow. Literally that same month. What cha what changed in them? Well, like w what specifically? So like, let's say, because if, if I'm imagining the D personality type, it's like I'm imagining like Andy Elliott. You know Andy Elliott? Andy, oh, Jesus. Yeah, he's, yeah. He's, absolutely. He's, he's kind of funny to see actually. He's, at the he's, moment. he's, he's created his own uh, grid. He's a yeah. savage. Uh, but yeah. it, but I, I think it he's works. He's doing well. He's doing yeah, I think it works for a very yeah, particular yeah. person in America. Come here to mm. Australia, he, he, would, he wouldn't last he'd half get, his he'd day. He'd get a small portion, but yeah. I don't think anyone would really like him. Yeah. yeah. Him, not him, but the style, right? Yeah. It's hard D. So so if you got something like him where it's like results, results, direct, you got to be like this, take your shirt off, right? Yeah, I saw that one. <laughs> what, what's the what's the different style? Like how does the S personality approach a similar sort of thing differently? Like what, how's so that how would we approach it? them as a coach? Uh, as, or, as someone listening to this, they're like, I kind of relate to that person. I'm more like that. How, yeah. how, do, they um, how do they change their style of communicating like you did with these people that yep. got them to have the best performance next so, month. So so it wasn't about them changing how they communicate. It was about them understanding why they were being told to do what they had to do, right? So it actually works before the sale. And this is why mindset is so important in sales, right? We have three pillars of sales, psychology, um, process, and execution. Psychology is about getting your head right. Like you got to be sold on your own product before you can sell anybody else on your product. And they were being told that they need to make sales because – this product had the biggest margin, so they've got to push this product. That This is making the company money. We've got these targets. We've got new investors coming on board. And it was all money-orientated. It just didn't make sense for It them. didn't make sense to them because they weren't that way inclined. So when I asked them, why are you here? What do you want to achieve for you, right? Maybe this, maybe the product or service isn't what you actually 100% believe in, but is it the right vehicle for you to be in at this part of your journey? And we just did some goal setting. Mm. I literally just asked them, why, why are you here? What do you want to achieve as a human being? Like, who do you want to be known as? Like, what do you want people to say about you? Um, I, I, I'll give you a really clear example. Um, a guy called Rob Hawks that used to work with me, he's now broke, uh, broke away. He's now a, a sales trainer as well. Very, um, very faith orientated. He was training when he worked with us to become a, a pastor at, at Glow Church, actually. All oh, right. Um, and he, um, he, we have ebbs and flows as salespeople and sat him down and, and, and he's an S personality type. The conversation was about, the more commissions he makes, the greater impact he can have in the community, right? He can, he tithes 10% of his, of the money that he has coming in. Yeah. So the conversation is not about making money. The conversation is about impact in the community. Didn't even do any training around sales capability with these three guys. Just got under their skin around why should they do it within that vehicle that they're in. 
Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and this is what I I never saw this coming, right? Because I'm I always say at the, at the start of our events, I'm like, I'm not Tony Robbins, guys. I don't want to be Tony Robbins. I'm an engineer that is a practical sales coach. <laughs> so I don't like the fluff historically. But what I've realized is that when we do, I do goal setting on the first day of our boot camp for like two hours. Yeah. At, even when we go into companies, that if we do goal setting, sales increase mm. before you get to any sales capability training. Clarity creates certainty. Yeah. Like I've just got a why. I've got a reason too. Like mm. why would I? focus on tonality and delivery and, and what order to ask my questions unless I've got a reason to. Yeah. Because it's, it's harder. It's harder to master these skills than it is just yeah, no to pick up the phone it. and read a script. What, what personality type do you think I am? You are a DI. I'd probably say so. Yeah. You know, like I, I am so familiar with every single personality type and archetype. Probably an ID, actually. ID? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I'm so familiar with Every single thing you could you, you could imagine when it comes to profiling people. Like I know how to profile people. I know more about them in less than five minutes than they know about their entire life through a series of 18 questions. But the disc one is one I've never actually looked into. I don't know why. I don't know. So, so people are like, yeah. oh, you're a high D or this. I'm like, I don't know what the fuck that actually is. Yeah, yeah. Um, but when you're explaining that, I'm like, D a little. And then I, yeah, I'm I. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm about, I'm about the people. Yeah. I'm, I'm about influence. I'm about the end goal. It's going to be purposeful. We're going to do things, but I like like the influence yeah. side of it, and and yeah, everything's a mess behind. Yeah, yeah, but but that, <laughs> but if you know that, and this is why, so I teach disc very different to when I got accredited. Like it's, yeah. I've, I've had people that are disc accredited for twenty years come and do my course and go, I've never seen it like that before. Cool. Because I, I like to think I make it real. Like it's 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 about sales interactions. It's about human interactions, and and it's it it, it, it that that's a real scenario. What you just said there, right? Is that it's messy behind the scenes. It's chaos. Yeah. So I know I would know that. All right, I would I would envisage that, which is cool, which means my expectations are that. So then I don't get disappointed with certain things. Yeah. Um, and and this is what I often say is that you're not going to change for me, mm -hmm. and most people haven't studied personality profiling. So my I never get disappointed in life with people because mm -hmm. I adapt to them. I don't expect them to adapt to me. And those people that are like, oh, I just don't get it. I had this guy on the phone today, and he was so direct. All he cared about was how much was it. I'm like, why are you annoyed with that? Yeah. Like so that long. that's the way they're wired. Like he was annoyed with you because you were trying to go deeper into a discovery. So I'll give you a perfect example. Um, and this is where, because sometimes if I'm, if usually for me, if, I, if I'm ready to buy something, I'm not just inquiring. I'm, I'm ready to buy. You're I've already buyer. done my You're the 10% buyers, yeah. Like, well, I'm just not going to waste an hour on a sales call to be, to be convinced. Uh, like the other day, I got onto a, a call this week. Uh, it was the only call I could remember in the last ages, actually, to look at doing a book deal, the book publishing company. That's something I want to do in the future, but I also knew I, I ain't buying today, and because because it's not the money, it's just that I ain't writing a fucking book right now. Yeah, yeah. that's just straight up. But I, but I'm curious on the actual thing. So we, we talked from the side. I said no intention of buying anything, but I want to understand how this process works. So we explained it all, and I said, well, how much is it? Da, 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 da. I'm like, cool, makes sense. Hey, look, let's talk back in about literally about this time next year. That's what I'm thinking of actually starting. He's like, yeah, cool, great, great conversation. I'll go back there, and when I go back, I'll say, hey, I want the eighty five thousand dollar one. Yeah. Um, but perfect example, I try to buy event tickets to an event. I won't know the name here in Australia. And, uh, it wasn't I was, my event, was it? No. <laughs> <laughs> this, this could go wrong. <laughs> I was ready to, I was ready to buy, right? Cause I got recommended by a few people. I'm like, yeah, I'm keen to go do this thing. It's, it's pretty good. Okay. How much is it? It's four grand. Okay, cool. Whatever. Um, so I, you know, you can't just buy it online as well. You have to book in a call. I'm like, fuck me. Like I'm a busy fucking dude, man. Book in a call. Okay. And puts it in my calendar. And then what happened was, um, we get, we get on the first call, okay? And then I'm like, i got not much time, okay? And then I'm like, hey, I, I'm curious to know. I want to get a ticket. Oh, yeah, yeah, we've, we've just got to explore it. Dude, I just want to fucking buy the ticket. How do we buy the ticket? Let me book you another call with our person, right? Because it's obviously an appointment setter. Yeah. I'm like, this is fucking annoying, dude. Like, take my money. Yeah, yeah. I know, take my fucking money. But then they fucked it up here. We booked another call with the dude. He rocks up. He's 10 minutes late to my meeting, right? So I five minutes, if I wait for five minutes, somebody, I'm off the call. Yeah. I'm off. He messages my EA. He's like, where's Morgan? And she's like, you were late. So he's on to his next stuff now. And then he's like, oh, what the hell? Like, he couldn't even just wait 10 minutes. And I was like, dude, send me the fucking Stripe link. Yeah, I'm in. Wow, wow. <laughs> and yeah. I haven't gone to that event still because I'm like, it's just so hard to do business well, with them. But and, th and this is it, right? So you done the four buying archetypes, like your buyers, your motivator buyers, tie kickers and legends. No. Through that sequence. No. So like, how do you spot 
a tie kicker versus motivated by How do you spot a tie kicker? Language. So they use absolute language usually. Um, uh. So they're the ones that talk in absolutes and then the motivated to buy is talk in procrastinating language. So they're, I'm, a, I'm a motivated to buy most of the time um, in that my C personality type adheres to being a motivated to buy like because I won't buy immediately. I'm not an impulsive buyer. Um, it doesn't matter how much I want it, I will not buy in that first conversation. Mm. It's just not the way I'm wired. I, I have to go and sleep on it. But I've had so many people try and close me on that first call and they are right to because the product is right for me and I know that as well. I just cannot fight my wiring. <laughs> so yeah. I'm like, I'm going to buy and I will buy it tomorrow and then they do something like, if you buy it today, I'll give you 20% off or I'll give you that and I'm like, don't ruin it. Like you literally, I promise you, I'll pay full price tomorrow and I will and I do. Mm. But do you I'm, have a time uh, convincer? I, I, I have to just, for whatever reason, well, yeah. I, know, I know the reason. It's I'm C, actually the same that. actually. I'm, I'm like, this is cool. Let me just, I, I'm not talking. I, I'm not talking to anyone. Can I do it tomorrow. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm not. I'm not. Like, you know, people go. Oh, I need to go and think about it. I'm, I'm not even sitting at home, just like. All right, I'm thinking about it. I'm not thinking. No one's thinking yeah, about you yeah. after they get off the call. Um, they've got their own lives to lead. Like, who's arrogant enough to think people are thinking about them? Um, I just. It's just time. I just need that bit of time. I do need. You said it earlier, right? Help people make sense. There's there's three types of salespeople: the teller. Just tell people how great they are. The giver, they just give information, never ask for the business. And the sense maker. Um, and our job, I believe, is to help people make sense of whatever they're, they're purchasing. Um, for me, I need a little bit more of, of sense being made. Yeah. So I need, yeah. I need an email. I need some bullet points. Yeah. I need some specifications. I need to see the roadmap and the timeline and the deliverables. That's just an, the way so I'm right. So if I was closing you, I would, I would know you're an engineer or the way you think. And I would actually have the intention. I'm like, I'm not going to close him today. But I'm going to send him every single piece of information and data point for him to make his own decision because yeah. he will. And you, and you're going to use and language. Nothing I could say that will close you. No. Yeah. No. And 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 I'll my I will get less sold the more yeah. you go on. Yeah. And I also, as a C personality type, the fluffier you get, yeah, the less I believe. So you say, come to my event, right? It's going to absolutely change your life. You've never seen anything like this before. Either. I'm like, I'm out. Uh, you, <laughs> you, you you had me at structured goal setting. <laughs> like I was in for that. Like for me, so if I've got a D, this is, this is I don't I don't really talk about this on podcasts. I'll save it for my elite class, but I'll tell I'll tell you. So um, for a D personality type, I'll be saying, well, let, well, let's get the ball rolling, and then get you the results that you're looking for. Yeah, well, that's my close. For an I, I'm like, this is where the fun starts. Come and join the Swish family. Mm. Right, that's how I literally so close me. an I. With an S, with an S personality type, I'm like, do you mind if I just recap everything so we make sure we leave no stone unturned? I don't want there to be any surprises here. That's how I will close an S. And then with a C personality type. It's the process from here is really simple. I'm going to outline everything in an email so it's really clear for you. Um, and then we can make an educated decision with every single bit of the information. Is that all right? And I ask for permission for the bottom two. I tell the top two. So D and I, I tell. C and S, I, I ask. Yeah. yeah. So that, and you've got to be quick, right, in that moment. Who have I got? Where are they? Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, oh, man, we've definitely got to do a round two because I know we're, we're, we've actually gone way longer than for like one of the longest oh, podcasts we've done. Oh, really? <laughs> um. And I knew that, but I was like, nah, this is juicy. So let's do a round two. I okay. really want to yeah. do because this is so fascinating, just un unpacking influence and communication of like how the brain works and personalities. I could talk about this. This is why I want to write a whole book on it. Yeah. Like literally like how to manipulate others and manipulate yourself. Right. It's a bit of a, it'll be a clickbait book. But because uh, <laughs> it's just, it's, it's, it's so good. So it, it can change your life. My, my, I actually had, a, I've got a girl that's flying back from the UK at the moment. Um, so she came here. She was here for six months. She went back for two months. She wasn't sure if she was going to come back. In the end, I booked her flights for her to come back on Monday. She's coming back in two weeks' time. And as I said, I said, here's my credit card details uh, to come and work for me. I said, you ready? We're going to book it. I was just chatting on Messenger. I said, this is a sliding doors moment for you right now, right? You're, this could change the whole trajectory. She's 26 years old of your life. Um, and for me, th that happened to me. I had that sliding doors moment. And, 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 it was, and I look back now and everything comes back to communication. Right, you want to pay rise. You want to get your kids been to bed earlier. Yeah. You want to get a new job. Everything comes down to how you say the words that leave your mouth, um, yeah. and it can change life. Like without getting too fluffy, it actually can. Yeah, I love this dude. Um, I've even got other things I want to ask you. So we've definitely got to do a round two. So Sweet. where can everybody find you and get access to all your training? Come check out everything you guys are doing. Um, I'm pretty accessible across all the socials: LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. Instagram is probably more babies and dogs um and then uh swish sales coaching.com is the website beautiful all right dude to wrap this up we've got a final question 
If you were to go back to your 18-year-old self and give him 30 seconds of advice, what would it be? <laughs> I was in Greece standing in, in a bar. Like uh, I worked in, lived in Greece for six months. Um, it would be, it, it's going to sound really cliche, but just learn to talk better, ironically. To learn to communicate because it would have accelerated absolutely everything. Get out your own way. Thank you so much for listening. And if you got value from this episode, it goes such a long way. If you can just take 20 seconds of your time, leave me a five-star rating and written review, then screenshot this episode and share it to your story. And make sure you tag me for that shout-out. And until next time, guys, go out there and dream out loud.